Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for people who are joining us online and thank you for people who are joining us in the room. Um, it's a big pleasure to welcome you all and to uh, welcome our Professor Janet Watson. She is going to talk today uh, and I will leave the floor to her. This, you are all welcome in our first uh, AIMS work in progress session. I will leave that, uh, the floor for, ja for Janet to talk and uh, by the end of the session, if we yeah. have any questions, we will open the floor. Great, for the great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you very much, Ruba. And thank you, everyone, who those who are joining online. Thank you, Ruba, very much for enabling this to be online as well. Um, so the title of my talk is Fieldwork, Choice, Chance and Change. And I took this subtitle from Blevins' 11 evolutionary phonology slight, in a slightly different order, change, chance and choice. It works for her theory and it works for my fieldwork journey. I first started thinking about this topic um, as I came back from fieldwork at the end of 2021, which a month of which I conducted with my lovely PhD student, Andrea Boom, who is here online. And I came back armed with a laryngograph microprocessor, a laptop, a digital audio recorder, and my <coughs> and a phone, of course. And my mind slipped back to the first days of field work in the Yemen Arab Republic, as it was known, and how field work practice, my field work practice, and I have changed. So I'd spent a month of a two month period with Andrea, helping her with her work on the flora of the far and its relationship with traditional culture. And I'm thinking, would this have happened in my day? So much has changed. For Andrea, we had to get ethical approval. We had to get risk assessment, risk assessment. I t I'm not sure whether that phrase actually existed in the 1980s. No. <laughs> <laughs> Ethics, it was still known at that time that people would record without the person being recorded aware that they were being recorded, perhaps even today not aware that they were recorded. And at that time, when you're doing your first set of field work, your life spreads out in front of you. Mine lies now behind me, a well-trodden carpet, and I want to talk about that. These issues, choice, chance, change, come all the time. The PowerPoint is going to be threaded through with my thoughts. We'll wander a bit and come back, hopefully come back to the point. So I'm going to talk about my work in the Yemen Arab Republic, my work in southern Yemen, my work in the FAR collaboration. And how my field work was peppered with mistakes. When we write up our work, we write it up as a nice, smooth, flat sheet. Even if it didn't work out, we don't say that it didn't work out. We showed what worked. We may leave out those little bits, the little bumps in the road. And I want to talk about some of those bumps. Went to northern Yemen, Yemen Arab Republic, and I just want to read out a little bit about the choice. So I'd <coughs> completed, I had a first class degree in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Exeter. I then went to SOAS to do a diploma in linguistics and was thinking about fieldwork location. I'd always loved dialects, having been mainly exposed to Kyrene, having ridden around the pyramids and along the racetrack <coughs> in Heliopolis. And I wanted to work on dialects spoken in the Arabian Peninsula. So that was one thing. The other thing 
was the fact that I love mountains. I love mountains and I love walking and I love rural life. So I didn't want to be in Cairo. I wanted to be somewhere else. And I wanted to be in a land which varied topographically significantly and that had a lot of dialect variation. And I often compare Yemen to Benetton jumpers. Those of you who are old enough may remember pictures of Benetton jumpers where they're being advertised. And why the red jumper, a red jumper like Robert is wearing now, looked beautiful was not just, Robert is here, it was not just because it was a beautiful red, it was because it contrasted with the blues and the yellows and the whites and the greys and the greens and turquoise. It's the variety, it's the diversity which makes something beautiful. It's not a thing on its own, it's relative. So I went to, I went to Yemen armed with my degree, with my diploma and with an arrogance that I would be able to understand these dialects, having read a few articles. And I spent a lot of time, very sad, in the mountains, crying because I could not even see a way into understanding. It took such a long time. So most of you will probably know where Yemen is, the south of the Arabian Peninsula. At that time, Yemen was divided into the Yemen Arab Republic and the, what was it called? Democratic Republic? All the communist places were called democratic, weren't they, for some strange reason. Um, so I, was, uh, I arrived in Sana'a, in the capital, around 2,000 metres. And I remember stepping out of the airport and being struck by the light. That light that you get at that altitude is extraordinary. A thinness. A brightness, a thinness. So I arrived in Sana'a and then I ended up doing a lot of my work in the Western Mountains. So um, hopefully you can see where the where the arrow is. So they're not marked on the map, but, but the mountains of Rema, the Rema, and then to the west of Ib, north of Da'iz, Al Junaid, and Hebeish. There were, of course, linguistic reasons for my choice. I wasn't simply going to a beautiful place. I could go do lots of nice mountain walking. One of them was the K dialects. And the K dialects, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and the other was pausal phenomena. And I've always been interested in pausal phenomena, particularly in Arabic. And I'm going to show a couple of maps from Bainstep. So here are this is a map of northern of the Yemen Republic, the Yemen Arab Republic, and the horizontal lines mark the area where you find K dialects. Now, what I mean by K dialects is that in standard Arabic, we would say Kitabtu. In K dialects, you wouldn't have T, T, you'd have K. So you'd have Kitabku, Kitabuk, Kitabuk, depending on the dialect, Kitabsh. For the second feminine singular, Kitabkum, Kitabkin, with K. Um, at this stage, and until very recently, we thought that these dialects ended by the border, very being uh, very politically correct, not going into Saudi Arabia. But in fact, they do go into Saudi Arabia, which is nice to know. And then these are the, this is the type of variety that you get in these in these K dialects, and the, you've got the T dialects as well. And this is just to show you the degree of variety I'm not going to go through. The other thing was um, glottalization, uh, causal phenomena. Um, and in this great central area, and we're finding it also in the modern South Arabian languages that I work on in Oman and Yemen, 
we have pausal glottalization. And what that means is when I want to say, he said, gal, or like to say, ga. He went, sar, sa. Um, I don't have any sound examples of that, but I've got some sound examples of this. This is the other thing, pausal nasalization, where final high vowels E and O end in a mm sound. And I've got a few, these, this is a set of, these are a snips from several different recordings with the nasal nasalization. And I'm hoping it will play properly. Uh, can we? We'll just. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Let's see what that is. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And when I was, I was thinking about those first days when I was walking in the mountains of Rema. Oh no. Wait, wait, give it one, one second. I think it's a best. It is a best. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> when I was walking in the mountains in Rema and attempting to understand, many years later. I, James, James and I were in uh, Sana'a with our children. Now Sana'a is the capital and it's so much clearer. The dialect is so much clearer than anything that you would find in, in the mountains or in the Tahama. What's that? <coughs> Sorry, what is it? Can I ask people online to mute their mics, please? Can you mute your mics, please? Okay. Yeah, you. great. <laughs> anyway, we were in Sana. Uh, now, those those of you who know James will know that his Arabic's not that bad. <laughs> he insisted that there was no Arabic spoken in Yemen. Yeah, it was a bit of a joke. But he would talk about instead of Mahwulumiya, he would talk about Mahwulhimiyariya. <laughs> you understood a bit. Um, yeah, I'm just going to skim through these. So major outputs on Yemeni Arabic dialect. This is a flat bit. This is the stuff that, that worked. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is arrival in Sana'a. And chance, what, what chances you get. So you get, you get chance when someone suggests something. Um, I worked with the British Organisation of Community Development on women's literacy for the first year or so while I was in, in Yemen. And that gave me the opportunity to be in Rayma and work in Rayma. But then that was my first mistake because I knew nothing about women's literacy. I knew nothing about development. And the big mistake that I made was thinking that you could talk about women's literacy without thinking, what is there going to be for women in rural areas to read at the end of this? If there's nothing to read, there's no point in the in the literacy. We think literacy is a good thing in general, but there are negatives about literacy. One of them is memory. One of my great friends in in Southern Oman is she's illiterate. She's monolingual in Mehri, and she has got such a prodigious memory. She is absolutely extraordinary. As a child, she was brought up by her grandfather. As a child, she would listen to poems in the evening, and by the morning, she'd memorise them. She still has all those poems in her head. She's memorised 
vast majority of the Quran. It's just absolutely mind-boggling. What do we do if we forget? We go and check our phones, we go and check our computer, we go and check Google, we check our books. How much we've lost by being literate. Um, yeah, something about being in Rarema. I haven't got, I, unfortunately, I haven't got a picture of Rarema, but traveling through the mountains, much higher than these, probably these will go up there. I remember thinking how absurd it was, the houses that were built there. You didn't know they were houses. You would look up because they were built out of the stone. You thought they were part of the mountains. They were just extraordinary. With huge drops, houses several, several stories high. And there was no electricity. And at night, you'd go out, there'd be a generator for a couple of hours. And then when the generator stopped, you looked up in these mountains and the stars would be the size of apples. You think you could pick them. I'll never experience that again. I'll never experience that again. The market. And I think the number of times I've got lost in the market. Getting lost is the best way of learning something. When I was in Oslo, I used to I used to ride my bike into the past the past the um, paved road into the paths up into the hills and keep going until I had no idea where I was. The only way I could get back was by trying to work it out myself and by meeting people and speaking the region. And that's how I learned the region. But another thing about losing something, I wanted to tell you a brief story about my good friend who I lost for a while. I hadn't been in contact with her from 2008 until 2020, I think. It was just before, just before COVID. And I tried to contact her. She was in Ib. I think this is Ib. Near enough. And I didn't have her phone number anymore because we used to phone using house phones. And I was meeting someone in Muscat, the leader of the Mahra down in Southern Amman, who came along. And they had a they had a, a journalist with them. And they, they said, we'd like the journalist to interview you. And I said, Where's the, where, are you, where are you from? And he said, from Ib. And I said, in that case, yes, I will provide this interview. Now, in Yemen, certainly in northern Yemen, you're not supposed to give you're not supposed to mention a woman's name. You mention, you say, wife of so-and-so or mother of so-and-so, but not their name. But how else was I going to find Halima? I had to find her. I had to give as much information online as possible, so I did. I said what her name was, where her parents had come from, the number of children she, she had, the name for her ex-husband. And it was two months later. Once I'd come back and I opened my email and I had this email from someone called Bashir and he said, I think someone might need to get some tissues. He said, um, I'm Bashir, I'm Halima's son and Halima is well. And we phoned, we phoned that evening, that afternoon, video phone and we spoke and we're still in contact. And that's something about field work that we very often perhaps don't take into account. You have your heart in your field work, not just in the field, with your consultants. Your consultants are not consultants, they're your friends. They're the people you work with. If something happens, I remember going to going to Sana. Each time I would go to Sana, I would think, pray to God that no one's been killed in a car accident. That would happen so often. This is this is Ib Jibla region, and you can see the, these are ancient houses. 
see the stores, number of stores there are. I went back to Sana'a just after the, just after unification. And there was a lot of change and I decided then to work on on Sanani rather than on the rural dialects because now I had a family and we were hoping to go and stay and it would have been really difficult staying in a, in a village with a long drop loo and no no water no running water just to get there because it would take a day at least to get there and very often I would spend the night on the way to a village we decided to go to I started working on Sana. Later we went to be stayed in Sana. And this was, I remember arriving in, in Sana <coughs> and it was after the first Gulf War. And the change, I couldn't recognise this town because of the number of migrant workers who had come back. Migrant workers who were working, I think it I think it was one ninth of the population of the population of the Yemen Arab Republic were worked as migrant laborers and they were all kicked out because of Yemen's stand on the Gulf War. So they all came back. If they came back with nothing, they came back with a car. So suddenly, although Yemen is still predominantly rural, you had a sudden switch in. Um, in the rural urban relationship. And they paved the sailor, this is the sailor. It never used to be paved before, which in some ways it made it look tidy. The worst thing for sustainability is tidiness, cleanliness, because the water doesn't seep down anymore to the water table sweeps off like it does here. This is why we have floods. This is why we have floods and drought in the UK, because there is so much paving. Okay. And I did a lot of audio recording and archiving with a very, very good friend, Absalam Amri, and he's going to talk here just a little, little while about the bathhouses in Sana'a. And you may, now that you know about postal glottalization, you may hear some. I'll just play a little bit of that. Whoops. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that. You can then, um, I can give you later a link to these recordings, a number of recordings that this submitted just on IG, which is held in Heidelberg. Uh, then in 2002, this was after the year that we spent in, in Sama'a, I worked on Qadaya Ijtima'iya Filad al al Yemeni, Social Issues in Popular Yemeni Culture, which was published um, with a launch party by the Social Development Fund, uh, led by Abd Karim Arhabi, who is sitting next to me, I'm behind the book, um, and this was it was uh, based on a, a radio program, Mus'id Mus'ida, that's Mus'id speaking there, Abdurrahman Taha and Mus'ida at the end. Um, and they would deal, they dealt with social issues. In, in a, a Sana'ani-like dialect, it wasn't full Sana'ani because it would have been difficult for people in other areas to understand, but it was pretty Sana'ani. 
and for that um, I wrote a I wrote a, an episode which I we perform I performed with um, Absalam Al Amri that's him there in Sonani and an episode in English which I performed with Tim McIntosh Smith there. Um, and this was preceded somehow, which I, I wrote for the, what's the time? Half past 11, half past 12. Half past okay, right. So, we'll so I probably got, just about got time to recite this poem. So I did this for, uh, for the launch party. Gullish ishtarelis de kriya jadkari, kama chibsirihim, bi khibatish, wu terjain, bi ahlamish. يا يمن سعيدة شسافر قريب بنص قلبي وعبشي ونص قلبي الباقي فيما سميت بلادي أنساش ما شنساش من حياة حياتي I didn't realize of course what was going to happen to Yemen in the years that followed and I remember shortly before that walking through Sana'a taking, going out through, we lived in the old city, going through the wooden door, pulling back the wooden latch, taking my son's hand in mine. And thinking this will never happen again. And Tim said it will, it will. I was right. I started to work on modern South Arabian. Um, in 2008 and this is my lovely Salem in form foreground who I've known since before he was born. He's now 11 I think. Um, and again, fate, chance, choice. So um, I'm just giving you this map with thanks to Marie Claude Simeon Sanel for allowing me, giving me permission to, sh to share this, which shows where the languages are spoken. So modern South Arabian are related to Arabic um, in the same way as Dutch, Norwegian and German are related. Um, and English, of course. Um, uh, but there's always there's always a non a non objective reason for doing study. We had thought of going to Salala actually in 2000, the year 2000, when we went to Sana, and my friend Tim, Tim said to me, "Learn Sanaani Arabic properly first. Once you can really speak Sanaani Arabic, then go to the South." And I'm glad that he said that. But we had already I'd already thought about it. But why did I start working on it then? Um, before we went to Yemen in the year 2000, some of our students came up to me and said, is it, is it, it's dangerous to go to Yemen, is, isn't it? And I said, yes, yes, it is dangerous to go to Yemen. They were thinking this, by this stage, there had been killings of tourists in the past, never, never, ever, ever been. And I said, yes, it is dangerous. The most dangerous thing about it is cars. You are far more likely to be killed in a car accident than be shot, despite the fact that it's absolutely riddled with guns, even now. Far more likely. And because now you'd never get risk assessment through to go to Yemen, you'd never get insurance if anything did happen. You leave your family bereft. Anyway, 
3rd of September 2004, it was the time of the Beslan school shooting in Northern Setia. Um, and I was in Oslo. And I went to, I was wanting to buy, I was on my own. I wanted to buy a television. I went to and I saw, saw what was happening. And I had the feeling that day that there was something really dangerous happening. The next day I went to Durham to see, see James and the children. And uh, the day after that, we went to work and I saw this email. And it, it was from a colleague in Yemen to say that my friend Alexander had been killed. He'd been working on Mehri and was doing his habilitation. I've nearly been killed in several car accidents. I remember one, we were going from some out of the Tahama. And a few days before that, I decided I would never, ever, ever going to travel in a long distance taxi, ever. At least not in Yemen. This was after coming back from Ib in half the time it should have taken. Between Ib and the Mar is what they call Negil Samara, the Samara Pass. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Hairpin bends, carcasses of taxis either side. <sighs> really frightening. But we had to get to the Tama, and the only way to get to the Tama was in a long distance taxi, and this taxi driver was absolutely out of his mind. We were going up a slope. And he decided to overtake a lorry on the right hand side, going up, going up a slope, which must have been about 45 degrees or something. And we were, we were all screaming. As we got to the other side, another lorry came and crashed into the lorry that we had just extremely foolishly overtaken, tipping that lorry into the path of where we would have been. Had the taxi driver not being mad. Anyway, I went to southern Yemen um, <coughs> to check on the text that Alexander had, had, uh, had collected and I stayed with Askarin Kriaran who is there with his family. It's not a very good photo, it was a bad camera at the time. Um, and one of the things I remember thinking when I stayed in their house is um, Challenging yourself is not challenging yourself to do something you can do well, better. It's challenging yourself to do things that you're really bad at. And one of the things I had to do when I was staying with Askari was sit in the house and not move, not go out. That was the worst thing ever. I'm hopeless at sitting still. But Askari taught me Mahri. Within a couple of weeks, I was able to speak. He was really proud. I hope he's still proud. Um, and when I first got there, it was the first time I'd ever heard the language real in real life. I'd listened to Alexander's recordings, but to hear it in real life, that was the first time. And I said to him, speak Mahri with me, even if I don't understand, I will understand. And it was a bit difficult for them. But I, I said, it's not the content that matters, it's I learn the language. Anyway, it got more difficult to go to Oman, to go to Yemen. So um, in 2009, uh, I was wanting to write a syntax of Mehri and wasn't able to get into Yemen. And just totally by chance, chance comes in again, and choice. I had an email from Said al Mehri. And he was thanking me for the book of texts that I'd produced, that I'd edited, Alexander's book of texts that I'd edited. Um, and the fact that I was interested in Mehri, and he'd written to me from the far, and I said, if I come, would there be people who could help me with Mehri? And he said, yes, of course. That was chance. But it's also trust, and I think trust comes into field work a lot. You have to trust, you have to even maybe don't know who you can trust but you have to trust and i trusted Said 
and I've never looked back. That was 2009. He's a really good friend. I went and stayed near his family and I now go and I stay. I moved between his family and and another family from this village of <clears throat> Um, Yeah, this is just very briefly the language varieties of the far. Um, it's the most, Oman is the most linguistically biodiverse country in the Arabian Peninsula. Although we could maybe say that Yemen is because a lot of the Yemeni Arabic dialects, those of you who speak Arabic wouldn't understand many of them. I remember Abdurrahman Taha saying that his, his children don't understand Hami Arabic. They don't understand the Arabic spoken in the Western mountains. Anyway, it's officially, Oman is officially the most, bio, most uh, linguistically diverse country. Um, and it was Mehri that I first started to work on them, Shahrat. So what were my linguistic and cultural reasons for choice? And I'm going to skip through this because this is less important than the actual subjective element of the field work. But large consonant inventories, lateral sibilance, uh, dual pronouns, possessive pronouns, lineages and quantification. Let's just see whether we can go through this fairly quickly. So I've got the Arabic consonantal phonemes on the right and Taharet and Mehri on the left. And you can see that there are more sounds in uh, Mehri and Taharet. Let's just get that down um, than there are in, in Arabic. And there are there are more in Saharat than there are in Mehri. So Saharat has got a sh sound, but it's also got a sh sound. The difference is a small difference in where you put your top. And for someone who has a list, I really shouldn't have chosen these languages. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm just going to play a little bit of Abdullah going through these sounds in Mehri so that you can hear the laterals and some of the emphatics. That was the other one. Um, and then it has lateral sibilance. And what's interesting about this is that we know that the uh, the ancient the ancient South Arabian had three plain sibilance S-like sounds, which were probably a sir sound, a sh sound, and a lateral s. And the this language family is the only example. Semitic language family that has this chat. Um, the other thing, whoops, the other thing which I um, which I'm interested in is the fact that you've got dual pronouns. And now I believe, uh, apart from Ugaritic, these languages are the. Are you trying to say something to me? No, no, no. No, right. The, these languages are the only languages that have a dual for the first person. Now, classical Arabic. Modern standard Arabic has a dual for second and third person, but not for the first person. So that's quite interesting. And they work through through the whole paradigm. So we've got a K, a K, hey, and then both you and me. Um, and we've got works with the verbs. Um, and you can see these as well. So I'm not going to go through those. The other thing um, is the fact that when you have a possessive pronoun in these languages, 
not all the languages take the definite article, but where they do, the possess you have to have a possessive pronoun and the definite article. So it would be like saying thee, my mother. Yeah. So kboil, a kboil, a kneili him. In Arabic, we've got al makan but makan you can't have al makan It could be like having al Um But you find this, what's interesting about this is that you find it in languages from lots of different language families, but not, but on the whole, not through the whole language family, which is quite interesting. So um, in Romance, we have it in Italian, whoops, and Galician, but we don't have it in we don't have it in in French, for example. So we've got la casa, la mia casa, and anai in the Galician, amini anai. We've got the definite article and the possessive. Um, Norwegian as well, but we don't have it in German. We don't have it in Dutch. So more and the mother, more and me, uh, the mother mine. Anyway, I'm interested in that. Um, in terms, whoops. In terms of lineage, um, lineages follow the father's line. We're going to expect that. But men are known informally by their mother's name. Either their mother's name or the mother of their father or some some important woman back in the past. So, so Khalid, our friend Khalid, who came over, is known as Khalid Ruey. Ruey is his grandmother or his great grandmother. And he's actually got Ruey on his passport. Yeah? Um, women are known as by their father's name. So I'm I'm Janet Bud Peter, yeah? and uh, Abdullah is Abdullah uh, Bud Peter. Ali is Ali Baruch yeah? um, and people can recall 18, 18 generations or more, and that's. Um, I won't play that now, but it's a really nice recording of the lineage being, being recorded. Um, the other thing that, that I'm really interested in, and Andrea is really interested in, is the fact that quant although we you can you can count however many you can count up to a million if you want to in in, in Mehri or Sahara, um, but numbers are not tend not to be used for traditional quantification things. So in terms of time. Time's always interesting. It's been interesting in Yemen. It's interesting here. If I want to meet someone and I will say, uh, I'll say to Ali, I say, when should we meet? And he'll say, okay. so, well, how does that translate into, <laughs> into numbers? And I find that, I find that really difficult. Um, we have, we have all these terms. One of the things, there were a couple of things that I'm interested in, that is the use of diminutives. So we've got subihan, which is the diminutive of ksobah. And we've got khasareyan, which is the diminutive of khasarawan, which I think is also a diminutive. What's interesting about the diminutives is that they refer to a time where the sun is lower in the sky. Not earlier or later, it depends on what side of the of noon you are, yeah? Uh, um, yeah, so Kalaini, Kalaani, Kalaan is later, but Subihan is before Ksobah, and, and the word Leben is before Dauban. <coughs> and it's really, the time is judged by the position of the sun in the sky. It'd be a bit difficult in our country, wouldn't it, to do it, I think. I mean, it would, it would work today, but it wouldn't have worked yesterday. Um, Dauban is referred to when the sun is in front of your eyes, that point. In the... I know it objectively, but I can't apply it. Certain things I just cannot apply. Um, anyway, these are the flat bits. This is what worked. These are the outputs. Um, but this is the story of the outputs and how um, I used to, I always wanted to be able to travel back in time. I travelled quite a bit before I went to Yemen. But going to Yemen, I did travel back in time. I went to a time where there was no electricity, where water had to be fetched. 
my food in some cases had to be foraged. And there are people in the farm who remember living in caves and keeping livestock in caves and can tell you stories of the plants that they used to block the goats in and keep them away from wolves and leopards. And I feel very honoured to be able to listen to those stories. What I would love, it will never happen, but what I would love would be to take some of my female friends by the hand and go back probably only 40 years, just for a day. They do say to me, you don't want to do that, you might get stuck. <laughs> but it's interesting when I talk to my, my women friends and I say, was it better in the past? I think of talking when I talked to my grandmother and I said, was it better in the past? And she said, yes, it was better in the past. And she'll give all sorts of reasons why it was better in the past. And I talked to Pachita and I talked to Wapia and I talked to Tifot. I say, was it better in the past? No. No, it wasn't better in the past. We may have been healthier. But now water comes out of the walls. We don't have to fetch it in goat skins. We don't have to forage. Um, <coughs> yeah. It was... Uh, do you want to stop me? Maybe yeah? Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, yeah, anyway, this, uh, milking, this is not easy. Uh, language revitalisation and corroboration, I can send you, we've just published our first children's book in Mehdi. Um, the language did not, just did not have a formal script, does not have a formal script. In 2010, we came up, uh, two, no, sorry, 2013, we developed a script based on Arabic. For, for Mehdi, and uh, we've got um, Salem and his shadow, Salem Wahala, which is, it's actually been published, it's in Spain at the moment, waiting to be able to come over, but due to Brexit, it's going to have to wait until someone can actually bring it over, due to tax, <laughs> tax regulations. Um, how we did local training, this was the first text that we produced in the new orthography, um, Just go on there. Uh, uh, with COVID, um, Oman started to put out messages in the in the local languages, um, and this was sent to me by Hamal Balushi. And then, um, yeah, don't really don't really need that. Um, so field work has been about choice, chance, change, but it's been about loss. Shnei can be sensed near the Guru. Over the years that passed. Um, yeah. I've gained a lot. I've lost a lot. And um, you leave bits of your heart in different places. Thank you.